This is Frederica, here and now. Today we're going to be talking about Father George Calchu, Father Gheorghe, as, as he would pronounce it. And um, you have, may have heard his name and wondered why do we keep talking about this guy. He died, his repose was three years ago yesterday, November 21st, 2006. And he was a very important figure to many people at Holy Cross. Father George died of pancreatic cancer, which is a very terrible, very painful and very fast-moving cancer and barely survived long enough to complete his one last trip home to Romania. You might remember at the time we were praying we would get to see him again, and, and he was home, came back to America again just for a very short time before his repose. The news reached us on a Sunday evening that he had taken a turn for the worse, and Father Gregory and I actually were having a gathering at our house that evening. I, I still remember trying to decide, do I stay with my guests or do I leave, and I left. And uh, thanks to um, Chris Vladimir Speckhard, who gave me a ride. We went together to the, uh, to the hospital in Alexandria, and I met some other members of Holy Cross were already there, Amel and uh, Catherine and uh, James, of course, and, and maybe others I, I don't, may not be remembering completely. Um, how I came to know Father George personally was that I had been for some time searching for a spiritual father, and I was asking everybody I knew to recommend and when I asked Bishop Basil, um, he said, well, Father George Calchu lives near you. Why don't you ask him? And I was astounded to hear this because I had read his book, and I meant to bring it with me, Christ is Calling You, which is um, the, only, the only book that he wrote that was published in English. And um, I, had, I had read this book and been very impressed with it, but I didn't have any idea that he lived anywhere, in a, uh, that he'd even made it to this continent. As far as I knew, he was still in Romania. And um, so I was, it was wonderful news to hear that he was available. So I drove down to his church, Holy Cross Romanian Orthodox Church at Bailey's Crossroads. Um, this, is a, this is a church I had noticed many years ago, even when I was still Episcopalian, because it's very incongruous. It's there on, um, it's a very built up area of Alexandria with big office towers and shopping malls. And in the middle of it, there's this little white clapboard church that's about 100 years old. And that was Holy Cross Romanian Orthodox Church. So I ended up going there to meet him and he did agree to be my spiritual father. If you don't know much about Father George, the one thing that you know is that he is a survivor of terrible torture under communism in his, in his native Romania. He was imprisoned twice, from 1948 to 1964, about 16 years, and then again another five years, from 1979 to 1984, a total of 21 years. Despite this, his most distinctive characteristic was his smile. He had a wonderful, a beaming, a radiant smile. He always seemed ready to be amused. Um, he, he seemed to be delighted with life and always ready to laugh. As I read about Elder Paisios, it seems to me he had the same characteristic of enjoying joking and, um, and, and always, being, always having that smile. Uh, it seems like there, there are two kinds of ascetics. They're the sober ones and they're the, the smiling ones. And, and Father George fell into that second category. And he was an ascetic, even though he was married and he lived in the world. Um, <clears throat> he fasted voluntarily, not just Wednesday and Friday, but Monday as well. I remember... <clears throat> And the first time he told me about this, um, he said, "Did you f and do you fast on Fridays during confession? I said, yes. Do you fast on Wednesdays? Yes. And do you fast on Mondays? And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and I thought, as sinful as I am, I thought, technically he hasn't told me as my spiritual father that I should. He, technically, he hasn't said that yet. <laughs> I said, is this a Romanian thing? He said, Yes. <laughs> And uh, I know that he didn't eat in the mornings. I, I don't remember if it was that he didn't eat until 3 in the afternoon or he didn't eat until sunset. As much as he had lived through and as much as he suffered, he really held himself to a very ascetic life. He was uh, very much a champion of those long, long church services. They weren't long enough for him. Um, he, he had a belief that you really couldn't pray in Akathis, not really pray it right, unless you'd been through a great Vespers first. 
So you had to prepare for the Akathist by doing the entire Great Vespers. So um, despite what he'd suffered, he was anything but dour. He did have no resentment that could be seen. He was naturally very affectionate. And when I went to see him, he told me to come every 40 days for confession. When I'd go into the church, he would be so happy to see me. And he would hold my hand, and we'd just stand there and smile. And I'm, a, I'm a big smiler, too. And I would think, now the devils are gnashing their teeth, and the angels are rejoicing. You know, joy is such a, a power like love. It's a, a joy that makes things change in the world. I remember the first time I brought my husband along so they could meet, and standing in the aisle of the church, he just took my husband's hand and just held his hand and stood there and smiled. It was, it was very sweet, very touching. He was the youngest of 11 children. He was the baby of the family, and um, I, he told me that he was his mother's favorite. <laughs> and uh, when, when I saw, you know, the baby, the littlest one, and... Uh, when I saw that smile, I would think, I am seeing his mother's smile. He's reflecting the smile that he saw looking down into the cradle when he was a baby. And he kept that smile all his life, no matter what he went through. He did suffer terrible things. He was arrested in 1948, first of all, the first time. He was 23 years old, and at that point he was a medical student. And he was imprisoned by the communists. And... Um, the, the terrible thing about this particular, uh, this early experience in prison was it was when the communists were trying to do re-education, they called it, by brainwashing. Only young men were chosen, only men between the ages of 18 and 25, because they were trying to make a sharp break with the past. So they believed they could take these, these young men who weren't fully formed by life, and they sought out those who were educated because they knew they were capable of learning. And then they tried to break them down. The preeminent place for this brainwashing form of torture was just north of Bucharest in the town of Pateshti, the, the prison there. You may have heard of others who were imprisoned at Pateshti. For example, Father Roman Braga, who um, is, is still alive, who seems to get younger every time I see him, uh, who lives at Dormition Monastery in Reeves Junction, Michigan. Um, the charge on which Father Roman was arrested was the, the authorities charged that he was trying to overthrow the government by discussing the writings of St. Basil the Great, St. John Climacus, and St. Gregory of Nyssa. So he was clearly an enemy of the, of the state. And if you have an evangelical background, you may well have heard of Pastor Richard Vermbrand, a Romanian, a Lutheran pastor who'd converted from Judaism, founded Voice of the Martyrs, an organization that follows persecution of Christians all around the world. He wrote a small book about his experiences at Pateshti called Tortured for Christ, and uh, many evangelicals are familiar with that book. Father George met Pastor Richard in Pateshti, and they remained lifelong friends. To the end of his life, Father George would fly out to California to visit with Pastor Richard. And there's a, a very sweet story. Um, I have this on one of my podcasts. It's a recording of Pastor Richard Vermbrand saying something terrible was happening in the prison once, and he got so upset, and he prayed to the Theotokos that it would stop, and it didn't stop. So he went back again, and he said, if you make this stop, I will write a hymn to you. And it did stop. So he thought, what, what hymn should it be? He said, well, everybody in the world, every language, we sing, rejoice, O virgin Theotokos, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Every language except Hebrew. And that was her language. But she's not praised in her own language. So he translated that hymn into Hebrew and set it to a, a very Hebraic kind of a melody. And there's a, there's a tape recording of that, and it's on one of my podcasts. You'll find that online. If you want the link, I'll, I'll mail you the link. At Pateshti, the goal was to break down the prisoner's mind and his sense of himself, to break down his memories in order to build him again into the, that ideal communist man. There were several stages. When new prisoners came in, immediately they were beaten and tormented by guards and by some senior prisoners who'd already been there for a while. They would be tortured and humiliated in many ways, and in particular they attacked their faith with blasphemy. Father Roman Braga told me that they had no calendar. You'd lose sense of time. But they could tell, for example, that nativity must be approaching because the, the blasphemous parody songs would all be variations on nativity hymns. So that was how they could sort of keep track of the year. He said one of the, the ironically enough, and this was when the Da Vinci Code was first out in the movie theaters, he said one of the things they would tell us in order to torment us was that Jesus Christ had had an affair with Mary Magdalene. 
And he said, for us, that was torture. For Americans, they pay money to hear this. <laughs> he says, here in the land of the free. And then he said, I am not so sure that you really are free. The psychological dimension of this process was called unmasking. Uh, and they were required under torture to renounce everything they had ever done, everything they believed. Uh, Father George said, he was compelled to say, I lied when I said I believe in God. I lied when I said I love my mother and my father. And as they were compelled to blaspheme and to reject and to say that their whole past life was a sham, they were exhausted and they would begin to doubt their memories and not be sure what reality was. And that was the goal, to break them down, to shatter them, and then rebuild them into the ideal communist man. Now this um, experiment actually only lasted a few years because word began to leak out to the outside world and the communists abruptly re they reversed course and you know, you know, it was like shocked, shocked, how could this be happening? And they went around looking for scapegoats and even executed a number of people claiming that they had come up with this terrible thing that the officials knew nothing about. Um, what happened to the prisoners? Uh, I don't know, you, you imagine, of course, some were driven mad all their lives. Uh, some committed suicide. Uh, for many, this destroyed them going through this experience. For a number of them, though, they began to heal. And with time, as the months went by and the years went by, their, uh, it was like health wanted to return in them. Health was trying to come up back to the surface. And they began to recover a sense of self. They began to tell true memories from false memories and actually could return to a sort of normal having kept this terrible wound inside, but healed with a scar. When people hear this torture, um, and the kind of things he went through, uh, I, I think all of us think, I couldn't do that. I would just, immediately I would cave. I would say whatever they wanted me to say, I just wouldn't be any good at that. And um, Father George, in, in his book, Christ is Calling You, in an interview about this experience, he says, this is so, sort of consoling, he said, of course, you do. You go ahead. You say what they want you to say. You're out of your mind with pain. You don't even know what you're saying. He said um, in, in Pateshti, it was a spiritual fight between good spirits and evil spirits, and we failed on the field of battle. We failed, many of us, because it was beyond our ability to resist. The limit of the human soul's resistance was there tried by the devil. Uh, Sister Nina, who... who transcribed this book, found the, the seven sermons, and basically put the book together. Um, he said to her, when you were tortured, after one or two hours of suffering, the pain would not be so strong. But after denying God and knowing yourself to be a blasphemer, that was the pain that lasted. We forgive the torturers, but it is very difficult to forgive ourselves. He said, after an experience like that, when he had, when he had said what they were trying to make him say, at night, when he turned again in his heart to prayer, he would feel such deep longing for God and such profound repentance that, that it was almost more beautiful than the prayer he'd known outside. Um, Father Roman Braga said, we will never again achieve the level of prayer that we had in solitary confinement. Um, that they found that they had very profound prayer in this place of suffering. Father George said, you knew very well that the next day you would again say something against God. But a few moments in the night when you started to cry and to pray to God to forgive you and help you, it was very good. There was one more stage to the brainwashing, the worst stage of all. The mentally and physically broken prisoner would ultimately be forced to torture somebody else. And this is what completed the destruction of their personalities. Father George said, under terror and torture, one can say, yes, yes, yes. But now, to have to act, it was very difficult. It was during this part that the majority of us tried to kill ourselves. Father George said he tried to kill himself by leaping off a three-story staircase, and it was only the prisoner next to him that grabbed him and pulled him back that saved his life. The Romanian poet Razvan Kudrescu wrote, All the life of this man, Father George, after the tragic Pateshti episode, was one of confession and sacrifice. In his soul and in his flesh, he measured the distance between hell and heaven. Perhaps no survivors of Pateshti achieved a moral victory as brilliant and as enduring as his. Because of the case of Gheorghe Calciu, because this case exists, it can be said that the Pateshti experiment was a failure. 
1964, 16 years in prison, there was a general amnesty. Father George was released. He had lost so many years of his life. At that point, he decided that getting a medical degree would take too long. He had to get some kind of degree where he could go ahead and get a job. And so he studied and won a doctorate in French, in French literature. He also went to seminary and uh, got his, his um, degree in divinity and was ordained a priest in 1973. During this time of freedom, he also met and married his wife, Pretessa Adriana, and they had a son named Andrew. Father George was employed at the Orthodox Seminary in Bucharest. He was teaching French and theology. And um, when, the ch when the communists once again began to really persecute the church, though, he started to speak out. They were demolishing churches. Um, uh, this Bucharest was once called the City of Churches. There were 365 churches within the city itself. And I forget, do you remember how many were destroyed? I, um, what would you do in a situation like that? Would you say, if, if we stir up trouble, we'll win nothing, they'll come down harder, maybe they'll close our church. If we're quiet and we don't say anything, maybe we can go on worshiping. I think it would be a very a legitimately good or a right to decide on either side. Father George, I always thought of him as a little lion. You know, he was small. He was not much bigger than I was, but he just was uh, so ferocious and so courageous. And um, he decided he would speak out. And he felt called by God to deliver a series of seven sermons, one for each week of Lent in 1978. They were addressed to the young people. He wanted to energize them and call them to transformation in Christ. And that's what uh, the series of seven sermons is called Christ is Calling You, and that's the core of the book here. There's also a wonderful interview with him and a few other things there. So he decided he would preach these seven sermons, and the, um, the, the leadership at the seminary were very nervous, and they didn't want him to do it. For the first four weeks, he was able to give the sermon in the seminary church, beautiful church, Petrovoda. Um, but there, the government was starting to pay attention. The seminary was getting more and more nervous about this. Um, so they, the next week, he came to give the sermon, and they'd locked the church. So he gave the sermon in the courtyard with everybody standing around him. Then the following Wednesday, he came, and they had locked the gates. And the, the students climbed over the walls in order to hear him. So his determination was met with a wonderful response. After the seventh and the last of these sermons, it was Pascha, there was a holiday, and during that week or so, um, Father George really began to receive serious death threats. They told him that they would, they would set him on fire in the street. Um, they also said, we'll kill your wife, we'll kill your son, who was then 12 years old. And um, his reaction, he thought about this, and he thought, what I need to do is preach another series of sermons. <laughs> Very characteristic decision for him. Um, but he wasn't able to. They fired him from the seminary. He was expelled, and in fact, his orders were suspended. He was not allowed even to dress as a priest anymore. So he paid a very high price. And um, he felt like he had so much more. He said, I wanted to explain and defend why I made the decisions I did and tell people about what I was facing as a result and all this. And he said, God said to him, you asked for seven sermons, seven weeks. I gave this to you. There is no need to explain and defend yourself. The sermons are not for the purpose of defending yourself, but to bring my word to the students and to worship God. Within a year, he was again arrested and sent to prison. The seven sermons, though, had been recorded, and they were taken, these cassettes were taken to Jerusalem. And from there, they were translated, they were typed up, put into many languages, and spread all through Europe and eventually to America. And Father George became internationally known as a political prisoner. He became sort of the, the poster child for, for Christian suffering in Romania. Uh, George Bush Sr., when he was vice president, came to Romania and had a meeting with President Ceausescu and demanded that he set Father George free. So there was a lot of pressure on Ceausescu regarding Father George. Um, some of the famous expatriates, uh, um, Eugen Onescu and uh, Mircea Aliada, also were saying to the president, you have to let this man free. And so Ceausescu decided he'd better kill him as soon as he could because this was too much trouble. He, sent, he assigned two roommates, cellmates, to Father George, who were both prisoners, who were both murderers, and they had orders to kill him. And instead, Father George converted them to the Christian faith. <laughs> A lot of victories in this story. Um, in the end, uh, Ceausescu was compelled to set him free, 1985, 
they were released and they came to America. And that was where he was when I met him 15 years later. I was looking for a spiritual father. And in light of everything he'd been through, I, I can't express how amazing it was to me to see this man, a living martyr, a survivor of torture, who at this point was 75, 76 years old, um, still so full of vitality and so full of life, still working full time as a parish priest. You know, I thought he would be retired with a title, you know, he'd have the chair of something at some seminary and really not have to do very much. But every day of his life, he worked hard as a parish priest, not only ministering to the members of his parish, you know, I would come sometimes and he would say, oh, this young man comes to see me. He hates God. He doesn't, he's so very angry. He said, well, I, I can't answer his questions. But every time I get a chance to talk, I just say the same thing. I say, I love you. I love you. I love you. Um, he told me about, oh, this woman, she's in such a terrible situation, and she's Romanian, but she doesn't ever come to church. But I get her groceries. And she came by today, and I gave her some more groceries. He was not satisfied with the, the work he had within the walls of his church. He was always reaching out further. Um, I, I, he just had so much energy and vitality and so much joy. He was also just physically strong. Um, there were times where I, I would know that um, he had taken the red-eye flight back from Europe and he'd been up all night and he got off the plane at 6 in the morning on a Sunday. And then he would go right to church and he would stand through, you know, three and a half, four hours of liturgy without a second thought. He said when he was little and, and standing in church and he would say to, my, to his mother, you know, my mother, my feet hurt. It's so tired. It, it's, it's terrible to stand like this. My feet ache so much. She said, that is a prayer. When your feet ache, that is how a child prays. He could, he could be very stern, though. I don't, wouldn't want to give it would be inaccurate to give the impression that he was a, um, you know, a softy. He was as firm with others as he was with himself. Um, when he was dealing with Orthodox who were careless about fasting, who didn't bother to come to church, um, who had a lot of religious emotionalism expressed, but they weren't really practicing the faith, he was, he was very harsh with them, very strict. Uh, I was able to observe how he acted as a spiritual father to the St. Herman of Alaska Brotherhood. This brings us back again to Christ is Calling You, the nun Nina who wrote it. Um, this was published by the St. Herman of Alaska Brotherhood, which at the time was not within canonical orthodoxy. Um, it's, a, it's a wonderful group of people, and I'd say the same about the Christ the Savior Brotherhood, loosely related to it there. Um, they, they did wonderful work, their translations, the books they publish, the Orthodox Word Journal. Um, they, they do street ministry. They planted parishes all around the country that were reaching out to the homeless and um, such wonderful stuff they were doing. But because of some accidents in their history, how they developed, because of some bad teaching they'd gotten, um, they believed that you didn't have to be submitted to, to a recognized bishop. Well, Father George did not politely overlook this. Um, every opportunity he got, he would hammer on them about this. He would say, you are not in the Orthodox Church. This is not a parish of the Orthodox Church. You're not Orthodox until you're submitted to a bishop who is a recognized canonical mm -hmm. Orthodox bishop. And uh, whenever he visited one of their parishes, um, there were parishes all over the country, again, he would get right on the subject and he would hammer on it the whole time he saw them. I'm sure that this had something to do with their decision in 2000. They did become canonical Orthodox. And um, rather than stay together as a brotherhood, they very humbly went to different jurisdictions, whatever was most geographically nearby. Um, so that was a, a very beautiful witness. I mention this because one time I had a, spirit, a speaking engagement at an Orthodox church that had been in the Christ the Savior Brotherhood. And all the time I was there, people were saying to me, I heard that Father George is your spiritual father. I'd say, yes. And they'd say, wow, that must be so scary. <laughs> he must be really a hard person to have your spiritual father. But um, he was always very gentle and joyful with me. And I think that he, he knows how to measure, like a wise physician, how much a person can take. And, um, you know, knowing me to be a, a soft and a weak person, that, that he would temper the medicine to exactly what I was able to bear. He was brilliant as well. As I mentioned, he first trained to be a doctor and then earned a degree in addition to a seminary degree in French literature when, when writing about the nature of memory. He might make a reference to Proust. Of course, he had read all of Proust. Um, one time I told him about a church, an evangelical church in Canada, where they believed the Holy Spirit was sweeping through the church. 
And one of the many strange things that were happening was people were getting down on all fours and barking like dogs. And, and he, when he heard that, he laughed and he said, it is the spirit of Anubis. Yeah. And I thought, Anubis, oh yeah, that's the dog-headed god of ancient Egypt. But it's like he made that connection right away. Um, he, was, he was very sharp, very, very quick. English was not his best language, and that's maybe my only regret is um, there were many times that we talked, and I was just not really sure I knew what he was saying. <laughs> and I would try to keep him talking, and maybe I'd catch on sooner or later, but I know there were gems that I missed that way. And um, I have to admire people who went to the trouble of learning Romanian in order to get the most out of that spiritual headship. Um, for example, one time I said, Father George, should, when I pray the Our Father, should I say, deliver us from evil or deliver us from the evil? And he said, isn't, isn't that the same thing? What, what's the difference? So his, his English didn't uh, allow for him perceiving some of those subtleties. As he lay dying in the hospital, after he had to all, all appearances, he passed beyond awareness. Uh, those standing around his bed were singing hymns and began singing the Octopus to St. George. And those who were there told me they could see him trying to sing along. They could see his mouth trying to form the words and to, to say the Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. And uh, when it was to, to cross yourself, his right hand swept up as if he was going to try to make the sign of the cross one last time. Um, the faith, the worship was so deeply in him. Um, I was going to conclude this pres presentation with a couple of things. I want to tell a couple of stories that I know about Father George. I'd like others to, um, yeah, I'd like others to share stories as well. We also have a slideshow um, that, that some of St. Father George's, not yet St. George, but you know, <laughs> you know, um, Father George's spiritual children put together. And I've got a little clip from a DVD that's about um, a minute or two minutes long. Um, and here he is in repose, um, November 21st, 2006, the Feast of the Entrance of the Theotokos. It was two days before his 81st birthday. And uh, I don't know if anybody else felt this way, but I, it just didn't look like him to me. It didn't, I, d I couldn't recognize him in the coffin. It was so much of him was his liveliness that it, it really looked just like a husk, you know, like, he, like he'd shed the husk. And uh, there was a lot of, lot of activity in that church over the ensuing days. There were so many people that come from all over the country for his funeral that um, they ended up having the funeral outdoors and um, all, you know, trailing down along, uh, is it Columbia sure. Highway? I forget the name, Route 7, Leesburg Route 7, Pike. Leesburg Pike, yeah. All these mourners trailing all the way up and down Leesburg Pike. Um, uh, Est is Esther not here? She asked me to tell a story of hers that um, she had recently moved from Canada to the U.S. and had had trouble finding an Orthodox church. She asked me to tell it first. She said she will cry <laughs> if she tells it. Um, and uh, that she was attending an Orthodox church, but she felt that they were um, that they had some barriers toward her because she was from Ethiopia. She didn't feel really welcomed and she didn't know what to do and felt sad. And uh, somebody had, Father Roman, I think, had suggested that she contact Father George. So she went and, tell me if I get any of this wrong, she phoned him and she could hear that he was, he was very, very eager to see her. He, it was as if this was, he knew it was an emergency. Um, that she needed to be pulled back from the brink and enfolded in the love of orthodoxy. And uh, so she was there in church on, on the Sunday, and she could tell he was almost hurrying through so that he could get to talk to her. And when he saw her at last, he put his arms around her, he held her, and she just cried and cried and cried and cried and cried. Um, and so they, he continued to be concerned for her. He recommended she come here, and we're very glad he did. So the end of the story is, um, it wasn't very long after that that she was talking to somebody at, Holy, at his church, I think it was, and said, um, I had such a wonderful time with your father, George. I'm looking forward to seeing him again when he gets back from Romania. That was it. And uh, the person she was talking to said, well, you know he's very ill. We're, we're thinking maybe he won't be able to come back. And she said, that can't be. I just saw him. He looked great. He was radiant. He looked completely healthy. Um, so she was a few weeks later, um, had, her dad was driving her to drop off her car and they went down Leesburg Pike and she saw all these people standing in front of the church 
And so on the way back, she said, just drop me off here. And she walked up, and it was his funeral. So she felt that God loved her so much that he arranged for her to pass right by the spot on the day of the funeral. It was a beautiful day. It was a little chilly, but it was very clear, and it was uh, an immense, immense crowd. All of us who were there will, will never forget it. And this was the quote that he wanted to be remembered for. Um, he wanted uh, this postcard was printed up, hundreds and hundreds of copies with, with his face. And it says, For my flock I leave these words, Love one another as Jesus loved us, so that it will be revealed that we are the sons of Jesus Christ our Savior. Sacrifice yourselves. Pray and be merciful to those in need. May the blessing of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be upon all of you. Amen. I'd like to open the floor to anybody that has any stories. I have some stories here, but I'd like other people to get a chance to speak. Um, if you put your hand up, I'll bring you the microphone. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. I'll hold the mic. Yeah. Catherine, um, she has some copies of the Orthodox Word. Um, this is a wonderful journal that we recommend, and here's an issue about Father George. I just wanted to read a small portion. Uh, these are Father George's words. From, this is from the issue number 255, published in 2007. Um, he says, While I was in prison, I was completely isolated in solitary confinement for two years. During those two years, I saw no other person except the guards. I heard no kind words. I received only insults and torture from the guards. Sometimes I felt abandoned by everyone, abandoned by Christ, abandoned by God, abandoned by my mother. My mother was dead, and there was a very strong connection between my mother and me, even after her death. At one point, however, some days or weeks passed, when I was absolutely alone in spirit and body, and I started to call on my mother. It was after two years of isolation and torture, and I was upset. I called on my mother, her spirit, I mean, and I said, Mom, you abandoned me. Until now, you were with me, supporting me. For the last two or three months, you have abandoned me completely. Where are you? Why don't you answer my questions, my cries? That night, I had a dream. I saw my mother. She was in front of me for the first time. My mother's face was sad. She was upset, and she said, How can you imagine that I abandoned you? After a few minutes, she disappeared. The next day, someone, I think it was Vice President George Bush, came to Romania and asked for my liberation. The following day, my wife and son visited me. A connection between us and a dear person, a member of our family or a friend who is dead, is real. It's not just our imagination. It's not a joke or some magical system. Really, if you love somebody, if you call somebody, he or she will answer you. So I say to you that between the militant church and the triumphant church, there is a continuous circulation among spirits. We can call upon our dear departed ones, and they will answer us. When I face difficulties, I ask my mom to pray for me. I am in difficulties, and she prays for me. I felt that she prays, and I felt the result of her prayers. Because I'm sure my mom is in heaven, and that she was a very important place among the spirits. What does it mean to be in the church? What does it mean to have the church in your soul, in your heart? In Pitesh prison, there were 1,700 young people, students. We came from different universities, both schools and of the sciences and schools of the humanities. We were educated in the family and in the church. We were under pressure from the guards. We were assaulted, tortured, in confinement. We kept the church in us. It was a mystical church. Our parents, teachers, and we ourselves have built in us an inner church. This church was with us even in prison. Deprived of any spiritual assistance, subjected to starvation, psychologically and physically abused, we preserved with jealousy this unseen church in our hearts, and it saved us. It's beautiful. Um, I'll tell a, a little story from um, his childhood. He was blessed to see the uncreated light on several occasions. The first was when he was eight years old. 
He said he was looking at a field of wheat, and he was thinking about what his pastor and his mother had told him about God, and he was thinking about God as the creator. And he's, uh, Father George said, In a moment I realized that the field was full of light. I could not understand what it was. This light had no shadow and no perspective. Perhaps I was accustomed to the image of natural light on the land. I could see all the details, but only in light, not in shadow. It was, I was as if petrified. I don't know how long I was like that. And when I recovered, the field was normal. Another time when he was in prison with these, the two murderers in his cell that he was able to persuade to become Christian. Um, one time they were praying together. He was standing and, and, and praying as the priest, and they were kneeling behind him. And he said he turned around to look at them. Um, as he turned to look at them, kneeling down behind him, he said they were in this light, visible light, uncreated light, but visible the whole cell was full of light. Uh, when he was um, speaking at a um, St. Herman of Alaska monastery, St. Paisius Abbey in Forestville, California, in 1997, he told a- another story about the uncreated light. This one was especially interesting to me um, because he, he became aware of something that he was doing wrong. Um, he said that it was Pascha. He knew because of the kind of blasphemous hymns they'd been singing and because of the ringing of the bell, he realized it was Sunday morning, Pascha. And when the guards came in to do their, you know, every, every day they would go through and go in every cell and check on people, the prisoner was supposed to stand and turn to face the wall and not say anything. And he said instead, he turned toward them, he looked them in the eye, and he said, Christ is risen. And uh, the, the cruelest of the guards was there in front and was startled and taken aback. But he said, he is risen indeed. He's despite himself. He came back and said, he is risen indeed. And Father George said, this shocked me very much. He, <laughs> he shut the door and I was petrified <laughs> of what he had said. And then, and then Father George went on. He said, little by little, I saw myself full of light. The board against the wall was shining like the sun. Everything in my cell was full of shine. I love that, full of shine. I cannot explain in words the happiness that invaded me then. I can explain nothing. It simply happened. I have no merit. I was perhaps the biggest sinner in the section. But nevertheless, God gave me this light. In a short time, this light disappeared, but the happiness lasted many hours. Later on the same day, a colonel came, Father George began to speak with him about the faith. And um, he said that he heard the colonel coming. I heard his steps in the corridor, and I knew that the guard was about to tell him what had happened in my cell. He was approaching my cell, and I prepared my answer. Now, it was like a theater, in a play or in a movie. I knew he would come. I knew his question. He knew my answer. He opened the door, and as I had done with the guard, I looked at him and said, Christ is risen. He looked at me and said, Did you see him? And I replied, No, I did not see him, but I believe that Christ is risen because of those who testified, the apostles, the martyrs, the bishops, the patriarchs, and all the Christians who for 2,000 years affirmed that Christ is risen and who answered, In truth, he is risen. You believe in things you have not seen. Did you see the North Pole? It exists. And you believe it on the authority of men of science. Did you see Marx and Engels? You didn't see them, but you believe in them because people of authority told you they existed. You didn't even see Stalin, our contemporary, but you know that he existed because someone told you. Because of this authority concerning the resurrection of Jesus Christ, I believe in his resurrection. He did not have an answer for me, but I felt something false in myself. No argument is able to convince somebody about Jesus Christ. It is a single argument to say Christ is risen. Can you bring forward some proofs that Christ is risen? No, only faith. I remember reading something in a Russian newspaper or book how at the beginning of the revolution in Russia, the communists sent people of science, people with higher education, from village to village to speak to the peasants and show them with scientific arguments that Jesus could not have risen from the dead. Trotsky, with a group of such devoted communist scientists, came to a certain village on Pascha. The police obligated the people and the priest one day, on the day of Pascha, to come to a big hall to hear the scientific arguments that Jesus Christ could not have risen. They said a lot of things, very intelligent, and at the end they asked if there were any questions. Then the priest, who in fact was a peasant, said, I have a question. They said, come here. And he came up to the front and said, you are very intelligent people, the intelligentsia of Russia. I think what you said must be true, 
but I want to say something. People, Christ is risen. And he heard the answer, in truth he is risen. <laughs> and Father George concluded, this is the single argument we have for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I, I'm, I'm telling, this means a lot to me because I spend a lot of time trying to persuade people of the truth of orthodoxy, of the truth of Jesus Christ, of, of these various things. And I think he, he really hits the nail on the head here about the limitation of arguing. You know, This is the single argument we have for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We can invoke the information of the Bible. To the unfaithful, it means nothing. We can speak from the Holy Fathers, and again, it is nothing to them. Therefore, it was enough for me to see in front of the Colonel, Christ is risen. We need no other proof. Because of just trying to prove to the Colonel that Jesus really rose from the dead, I felt something wrong in my orientation. Since then, I gave up trying to give proofs to the guards or to the inmates, the criminals. I learned from experience that people are changed only by the fire of your faith. People are changed only by the fire of your faith. That's why it's so important for each of us to be transformed in Jesus Christ, because nothing you say can hold a candle. We speak in these analogies of light to the fire of your faith. People are changed only by the fire of your faith, by the dedication in your attitude to them and to God, because this is the most powerful proof. Any, any other questions or comments? Yes, Ina? I just wanted to... Um yeah, old crying Ina, we know her. There she goes. There she blows. <laughs> you were saying about um, the first time I my father was giving a sermon and everything, and Zach was trying to whisper in my ear to tell me what we were saying, and um, finally we stopped because it's, it's distracting to yourself and to others, and, um, and it didn't seem to matter. He was talking away, and I was just crying and crying, and I had no idea what he was saying. And, <laughs> So it was interesting, and the same sort of a thing, I, I went one time to the Feast of the Holy Cross, it was on a, on a Tuesday morning or something, and we'd already had an evening liturgy here, and I went just by myself, all boldly down there, not speaking a word of Romanian, and uh, so the service went on, and we, um, they came out, and as some of you may know, during the great entrance in a Romanian church, everybody kneels. So I knew to kneel. They have little pews. They're very close together. I was trying to get down in the, <laughs> in the pew and kneel. And I, I had my head down and I was praying. And again, very conscious that I probably will do something wrong. Because I was always doing something wrong in the, <laughs> in the various uh, Romanian monasteries where they were patting on the head or pulling up or down or something. Anyway, this... Um, so I was conscious, and I sat in the back just so I could see what everybody else was doing. But I could not see. I mean, I saw that everybody got down to the great entrance, and I knew that the great entrance should be coming about now. So I got down um, and was in this pew. And then I was waiting and waiting, and I, I heard, and then all this commotion, 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 banging, banging, banging. And what was happening is that Father had stopped the great entrance and was pulling all these people out of the way so that he could make his way all the way through the pew to get to me so that he could put the chalice on my head. Oh. And I looked up, oh. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> wow. It was, it was very powerful and very amazing. And, you know, he just was like that. I mean, he wanted to be sure that I had that full blessing, although I was the total stranger. And uh, so then when we were downstairs, he would always speak in English to me. Twinkling, twinkling, always. But, yeah, um, yeah. I found that he communicated almost more strongly to me not in yes <laughs> yes ah oh, that's beautiful any other reminiscences or stories or anything else you want to see? here's cal well i you know all the other wonderful things about his eyes and his smile and his his presence uh experienced those just a few times myself but he was intensely practical colleen and i sponsored a baptism as uh, godparents for a little sarah judd and um so there's just a handful of us in the church, and uh, and the you know he did a big long service, you know, and just as long and complicated as he could make it, he, he would do that, and but mercifully a good bit of it in English anyway. So we're all done, and we were in the sacristy afterwards, and I was kind of glowing from this spiritually charged you know service, and going on and on and on. He smiled and he said. Yes, yes, yes. He said, that'll be $300, please. <laughs> <laughs> they had a, the church had a fee, and the godparents paid 
a fee to the church when you sponsored someone, which I didn't, you know, didn't know about. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Uh, one one. Got one. Here we go. Wait, one quick one. Um, we used to take. I used to take the St. John students Colinde, which is Romanian Christmas caroling, um, every year, and we would join Santa Cruce. Um, at a couple of stops as they would go around to their various parishioners. And I'll never forget um, <laughs> being in the house of one of the, the parishioners when Father uh, George came in. And in Romanian, he said, Doamne uh, ajuta păcătoși, with a big smile on his face, which means, may the Lord help you sinners. <laughs> Just with that huge grin that Maria Frederica was just mentioning. Just the, the love yeah. that came through him was very evident. That's wonderful. I, I feel closer to him now, in a way. Now there's no language barrier. Um, I don't know if there's anything more. It's, we've been here a long time. I know some of you are just really eager to go. Um, we're going to play some Kalindi if we can figure out how. It'll be our uh, recessional music. Yes. I want you to tell the story of going to see him at 9-11. Oh, and coming oh. in, the, I mean, you know, yeah, and coming in the back of the church, and you're so mm, upset. That's true. That's true. Um, I, you know, I'd forgotten about this. Um, September 12th, I had an appointment for a confession. September 12th, 2001, and so I drove down. I didn't know if I'd be able to get all the way through Washington. I drove past the Pentagon. They were still hanging a tarp. Um, it was something, and I, I came in, and um, I was talking. I was all sort of stunned, you know as we all were, and he said to me, why do you think that happened? And I thought, I, not a question that occurred to me. And um, he said that he had gotten up to pray in the night, and his Bible had fallen open to the psalm. I forget which one it is, unless, um, unless the Lord guard the, the house, those, those who watch, watch in vain. Um, and he said, uh, think about how many people were watching. Think of how much security there was and for them to get past all of this security, for this to have happened, despite all the watchers. Um, the Lord wasn't guarding the house, and there was a reason for this, that God does use, does sometimes use disaster to bring people back to penitence, and that America has a lot to be repenting of. Um, this was certainly something nobody else was saying at the time. It was something I was thinking because it's the Old Testament pattern. Wherever um, the, the people of Israel met with a disaster, they would say, we need to repent. And that was so not what America did. Um, I was not able to say that in my own voice because everybody would shout you down, but I was able to write and, um, and print up what Father George had said, and I thought it was, I thought it was very acute, um, an outsider's perspective. Um, the, the other thing, though, was he believed that America was also supernaturally protected and that we did not have as much disaster as other people do because of the simple people all over the land that love Christ. And that this, um, this, this very simple, very pure, but, but urgent and heartfelt love for Jesus, um, he thinks that God continues to spare America for the sake of that love. And he told a story about having just come back from Paris, and he said if the if the president of Paris said, you know, God bless France, they'd throw him out of office. <laughs> you know, you go into a bookstore, you can't find any religious books. But he said, as soon as I got off the plane, I got in a taxi, the taxi driver tried to tell me all about Jesus Christ in the Bible. <laughs> and he said that that is why God blesses America. That is why God will continue to bless America, because Americans all over this country love his son so much. So that was a beautiful ending. Anything, anything else? Um, thank you so much for being willing to wait a long time today. And, uh, we'll, we'll play some Christmas carols with you. This is Frederica Matthews Green. You can reach me through my website, frederica.com. And transcripts of these podcasts are gradually being posted there as well. My speaking calendar is handled by orthodoxspeakers.com.